For in thy mercy and fidelity thou hast promised him as Savior to the lost race of men, to instruct the ignorant with his truth, to justify the wicked with his holiness, and to help the weak by his power. Words taken from the Advent Preface. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I would like to share with you this morning some highlights from an article I recently read regarding a dangerous situation in our beloved country. The piece is entitled, quote, Are you ready to be an American kulak? Unquote. The author of the article, in my opinion, carefully and intelligently exposes the methods and goals of our revolutionary enemies, and yes, even globalist leaders who seek to destroy our nation and its glorious heritage. Under the guise of promoting justice, they always speak this way, fairness, equity, equality, diversity, anti-racism, our revolutionary enemies and globalist leaders are largely driven by envy, bitterness, hatred towards regular, ordinary people in America. In short, many of those in power in our nation have hostility towards the people who most resemble Americans of the past. That's where their hostility is aimed. The author of the article states that the modern American regime is often openly, quote, anti-white, anti-male, anti-Christian, anti-rural, anti-middle class, unquote. And as our dear country continues to decline dramatically under the leadership of such people who hate their country, squandering the incredible inheritance that we have been given, quote, the more hatred it directs against those who symbolize what came before, unquote. So as, as the country declines, the hatred towards those who want to recapture the American past, they're hated the most. The very sight of God-fearing Americans seeking to live the traditional American dream, seeking to work hard, raise families while honoring our history, our founding fathers, our religion. This is an accusation against them and their disgraceful policies. Now, the article in question uses a Russian term that may not be familiar to many of you, namely the term kulak. Initially, the word kulak was a bad term, pejorative term, that was used to describe greedy misers and usurers who profited from the misery of other people. But the Marxists in the Soviet Union co-opted that term and applied it to anyone in Russia who owned their own small farm or owned their own small business, blacksmith shop, for example, or those who were very industrious or those who employed other people or those who in any way strongly opposed this forced seizure of property for the collective farm of the future in the Soviet Union. The kulaks were those peasant farmers who actually worked very hard, and they actually supplied food for most all of Russia. Using today's terms, the kulaks were solid, working-class, regular people, perhaps with a bit of savings, maybe even middle-class folks who owned their own homes and their own means of production. Kulaks were productive people that were essential to the health of the Russian nation. But the communists would make them an object of hate claiming that they were the true enemies of the Russian Revolution. The kulaks therefore became the scapegoat, the scapegoat for every failure of the Marxist government. They were used to distract the population from corruption and mismanagement in the communist government. you got to have a scapegoat to take the blame. The kulaks were soon persecuted, with many of them being rounded up by authorities. They were then deprived of their land, stripped of their small businesses and their possessions, and driven off into exile or even executed. A liquidation program, if you will. The Kulak way of life was to be destroyed in what was termed a de program. Of course, 
With most of the Kulak farmers now in poverty and exile, famine came upon the entire country of the Soviet Union. Famine. Take away the peasant farmer owners, famine results. Few, if any, industrious farmers were left to supply the needed grain. But if any, starving individuals united and somehow rose up in complaint or even revolt against the regime, the regime labeled it yet another kulak revolt to be violently put down. For it was impossible to believe that any true worker in the Soviet Union would ever complain about the worker's paradise that was so present there. Any critics of the regime were labeled kulaks or kulak enablers. The author of the article observed that, quote, when harvests, industrial output, or overall growth failed to meet the Communist Party's lofty promises, this led to even more hatred heaped upon the kulaks. Are there shortages of supplies? It's the kulaks' fault. And then the author points out, quote, the kulaks were a living, humiliating embodiment of the system's failure. For they were peasants who succeeded based on their strong abilities and not as some achievement of the socialist system, unquote. I remember now the name of the article is, quote, are you ready to be an American kulak, unquote. You see, the liquidation of kulakdom in our beloved country is well underway. Our own regime and the cultural powers that be are going after and targeting regular, God-fearing Americans that largely occupy the middle class of our nation. The author states, quote, the white American middle class have become America's kulaks. You hear it every night in the news. White privilege. White supremacy, the greatest problem in today's world. The white American middle class has become America's kulaks. They're blamed for every problem. They're attacked for every success they experience. And they are deserving of every punishment, like reparations. Their destruction has become a fundamental goal of the American political life. The author continues, quote, the American kulak, whatever his color, is a person who understands the great country that America was. They are a person who expects and demands safe streets, effective infrastructure, quality schools, education, and who helped create and perpetuate those things in the past. And when the author adds this, quote, the American kulak is a person who remembers and longs for a country that didn't hate its own people, didn't hate its own heroes, and didn't hate its own history, unquote. At the kulaks in Russia, the American kulak often finds himself located more in country regions, rural regions, than in the powers of the city, the central powers. American kulak, like his counterpart, in the old Soviet Union, finds that he is not connected with real any worldly power. His voice is often drowned out, and those who try to speak out are oftentimes censored. The American kulak, like the Russian kulak, has become a scapegoat for every national problem. You need someone to blame. To be a kulak today is to be a racist, a white supremacist, a religious bigot, a capitalist pig, a misogynist, a deplorable, a racially prejudiced individual that has only experienced privilege in his life. The marks, the characteristics of the American Kulak are hard work, objective moral, moral morality, the traditional family, growth, respect for authority, and delayed gratification. But I would not want to suggest that somehow the American regime, though it aims its venom at these people, we don't want to suggest the American regime, like the Soviets of old, is actually plotting the violent persecution or even extermination of the American kulak. But I would say that those elites in power, in government, big corporations, media, continue to make American kulaks the only real villain 
in American society. There's only one villain now. It's the American Kulak. The author observes, quote, just like the Kulak farmers in Russia who drew envy for their success every day that the ordinary middle class continues to exist at all is a daily indictment on the present system. Every day their children succeed in school is a day that the racial achievement gap fails to go away. Every home they buy and improve widens the ownership gap. And every successful business they create is one that doesn't qualify as a minority-owned business, unquote. Again, the outright extermination of the American Kulak might not be the goal, but perhaps their slow elimination over time by bringing in replacements from foreign countries by means of mass legal and illegal immigration. Let's call it the Great Replacement Program or do de-kulakization American style, where the camp of the Kulaks is overwhelmed by invasion. And then a more pliable group of serfs are brought in to serve the elites who have the majority of the wealth and supplant the more independent or perhaps resistant Kulaks. Combine this with various riots we've seen so often these days, arsonry, of small businesses, mass lootings of franchises and businesses owned by kulaks that seemingly occur without any protection of their property and no punishment of the criminals who do it. But as the author suggests further on in the article, the attack on the American kulaks is mainly about demoralization. That's their great weapon. The author writes... Quote, America's de process is above all about breaking and demoralizing Americans so that they will no longer demand or expect better and providing a villain for the globalist American empire to project its failures onto, unquote. The American Kulak is the scapegoat for a negligent and derelict regime which needs, like the Emperor Nero, a fall guy to explain why Rome is burning to the ground. The author of the article then offers some advice to end the article. He states, quote, The American Kulak class must understand the nature of the campaign against it if it is to survive. American Kulaks are not participating in an ordinary democratic republic anymore. They cannot reason with their foes by pointing out all the harm they will suffer from the American regime's suicidal policies, whether it's emptying prisons, obliterating borders, and replacing mathematics with some CRT programs. The author continues to end saying, American kulaks must realize that the hatred brought against them will not lessen as the ruling elite's policies fail. Instead, hatred will intensify. The author then concludes, the American Kulak must realize this struggle can only end in one of two ways. Either the regime that hates him will be put down or he, the Kulak, will be destroyed. As I bring this sermon to a close, I would like to add that there are also, let's call them traditional Catholic kulaks that are being treated in a similar fashion to their American kulak people too. Catholic kulaks are those who are attached to the old faith. They're attached to the old mass and are unwilling to embrace the present zeitgeist in the modern world. They are anti-modernist and counter-revolutionary in their mindset and ways. That's the way they think. They simply want to live, believe, and pray in the way that Catholics have always lived, believed, and prayed. We want the Church of St. Francis. We want the Church of St. Catherine of Siena. We want the Church of St. Peter and Paul. That's all we're looking for. These Catholic kulaks have a longing for restoring the holy faith and all of its purity without any compromise, no ambiguity, no unclarity. We long for a church militant 
which is not embarrassed about its past, but rather celebrates in the church's past triumphs. They long for a strong Catholicism and a visible Catholicism with glorious churches built for the glory of God. They long for priests and cassocks, sisters and habits, and they long for orthodox seminaries and schools. And they long for glorious solemn liturgies and public processions. They desire, in short, meat and potato Catholicism. And because of this and more, Catholic kulaks are hated. Catholic kulaks become a scapegoat of many of the problems in the church today because they are an obstacle, we're told, to the full implementation of the spirit of the council. They are enemies of the revolution. They're holding us back. Their very presence in the church and their regular attendance at the traditional Latin mass serves as a rebuke an indictment of the present state of affairs in the modern church as it closes more and more properties and shuts down more and more parishes and apostolates as membership is hemorrhaging. Who's to blame? Got to be the kulaks. Every time Catholic kulaks begin to flourish and thrive just a bit, their very success is an accusation against the modernist regime that presently dominates the power centers in the church. So like the kulaks of old, who had their own farms, they owned their own small businesses, they have to be taken away from them and sent off into exile. And so Catholic kulaks are now stripped of the sacraments. They can't have traditional confirmation anymore. Sorry, taken away. Used to have a Latin mass at this parish, but you know what? It's now taken away. Kulaks must realize this as they become more deprived of their priests who can no longer say the old mass. They're deprived of their chapels, which they used to go to mass at, and they're sent off into exile into what has been termed a non-parochial setting, a non-parish setting. Catholic kulaks must realize that they, like their counterparts in America, are dealing with a revolutionary enemy that will not listen to reason. They will not even listen to the faith. And they will not listen to their concerns regarding the suicidal path taken by the modern membership of the church. This is a war between tradition and the modernist revolution. And there is no surrender. There's no negotiations. But we can rejoice in what St. Athanasius, the great father of orthodoxy, once said so long ago. To paraphrase him, the modern revolutionaries may have all the centers of power. They may have all the big churches. They may have all the institutions. And they may have all the chanceries and the bureaucracy and all the financial support. But we, the Catholic Kulak, we have the faith. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.